Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today on our checkerboard chat. Um, I'm Dr. Kelly Vineyard, and I'm one of the equine nutritionists on Team Purina. And I'm here in my home office in uh, Gainesville, Florida. And I've got some uh, experts here I'll introduce you to in a second. Um, but today, we're here to talk about the next frontier in equine nutrition. And I love saying that. Because I feel like it's like kind of like Star Wars, a little futuristic, um, but that's because it is. Um, we're going to talk all about the equine microbiome. Um, it really is one of the last things that we still have so much more to learn about um, and that there's so much potential there. So um, get your questions ready, you know, tell us where you're from and um, hopefully we're going to answer some of your questions uh, with our experts today and also um, you'll get a little bit of an inside look at our commitment to research and learning more about the equine microbiome. So first, I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Karen Davison. Hi, Karen. Hi, Kelly. Um, Karen is in her home office in Gonzales, Texas, and she is the director of our equine technical solutions team uh, for Team Purina. She's a nutritionist, um, been with Purina for a very long time. We all know and love Karen. Um, and we also have Dr. Robert Jacobs. Hi, Robert. Hey there. Um, Robert is from his own home office um, up in Gray Summit, Missouri, which is right um, near where our research farm is. And uh, Robert is also the equine innovation manager. Um, so basically, he directs all of the, uh, the research going on there at the farm. And I'm really excited to introduce you to someone new today. We've never had um, Morgan Bowman on a checkerboard chat before. Morgan is our equine microbiome scientist. And yes, that's her title. Um, we hired her about a year and a half ago. Um, she um, got her master's degree uh, in equine nutrition um, from NC State. And she is here with us now focusing on moving forward our knowledge about the equine microbiome and this microbiome project we're going to talk about. And, and so Robert, you and Morgan work daily. Morgan's also at her home office in Gray Summit. She works at the farm every day. Tell us a little bit more about kind of how we have brought Morgan on and how this relates to our commitment to the, the EQ project. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, first off, thanks everybody for, for uh, logging on here this afternoon. Um, so the Equine Microbiome Project, what we have now branded the Jarena MQ or Microbiome Ocean Equine Project, um, was something that actually started about three years ago when Dr. Mary Beth Gordon, who you guys have all met before in a checker paper chat, and I were sitting in a hotel lobby, you know, back before uh, COVID times when we used to do all that. Um, and we actually uh, sketched this all out on um, a couple napkins. And we were like, how are we going to identify or how are we going to describe what the equine microbiome is. Because just like you said, Kelly, this is the next frontier in nutrition. And it's not just nutrition, it's all the areas of equine physiology. Um, and so from that point, um, we presented this project to uh, the, the leadership of Purina and, and, and we were actually selected, um, our project was selected to be funded um, by the leadership of Purina. And, and you know, this is not a small undertaking. Um, all of the equipment, the expertise, the hiring of Morgan, um, you know, this, this is a big undertaking by Purina and really shows the dedication to research that, that Purina has because, you know, without understanding what the microbiome is, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, it's really hard for us to say, okay, what are the changes? that we wanna to make to the microbiome. And so for us, this is that first step. And so, you know, Morgan came to us, um, he said about a year and a half ago, she's, you know, working at, uh, was at NC State at the time, um, and currently is working on her PhD um, and with, with NC State as well. She's got some great nutritionists and physiologists and veterinarians on her PhD committee, including Dr. Gordon and uh, Dr. Blixlager and Dr. Pratt Phillips and others from the NC State University. Um, but she is working with us and really, you know, the, the, the muscle and the brain uh, behind our MQ equine project. I like that. The muscle and the brain. I think that's, that's your new nickname now, Morgan. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. Well, we look forward to hearing all about this project um, here coming up. But I think a good place to start this chat is really to let's define the microbiome. And 
So Robert, um, you've been studying this very in depth for a while now. So tell us, you know, what is a microbiome? Where where is it found? Absolutely. You know, the the microbiome is this buzzword, right? We hear it from human nutrition, baby nutrition, puppies, dogs, cats, everything under the sun. But related to equine nutrition, you know, this is something that we have heard a lot about and we continue to hear more about it. And I promise you, we're going to continue to hear more about the microbiome. Um, but to your question, Kelly, what is it? At the most basic level, it is it is just the combination of all the bacteria, viruses, yeasts, and protozoa that encompass a certain area of the horse's body, right? When we talk about the microbiome, and for the purposes of this conversation today, we're going to be very heavily focused on the fecal microbiome, which is, is indicative or an indicator of the, the gastrointestinal microbiome. Now, we're very well aware that, you know, the microbiome of the horse changes from nose to tail right? The mouth has a different microbiome than, than the throat, which is very different from the stomach, the small intestine all the way through. But for us, you know, unfortunately, I can't go to, to, to Karen's house and, and grab, you know, a real easy small intestinal microbiome sample from her horse. But what I can do relatively easily is I can grab a fecal sample or I can grab a fecal swab. And we're going to talk about that more. Um, but, you know, at the most basic level, it's just all of that genetic material, right? Yeah. Most importantly, we look at the bacteria, um, and that's what we're really focusing on is how do all those individual bacteria, you know, interact with the horse itself. Um, but but the microbiome is just this fascinating kind of organism within your within your horse, within yourself also, but within your horse that interacts with the horse, the horse interacts with it. And it plays a role in all the different areas of physiology that we study and that we, we use nutrition to impact in the horse. Yeah, and I think it's it's really interesting that people don't understand. We even have a, a microbiome on our skin, you know, yep. like all sorts of different areas of our body and physiology are associated with the microbiome. But of course, we're all here to talk about the hindgut today and the horse fecal microbiome as it reflects the hindgut. So Morgan, you know, when a foal's born, they essentially are born with a kind of a sterile GI tract. So how does that microbiome get established in that baby foal? You're right, Kelly. So this process starts very early in life. So when the foal is born, it is exposed to bacteria on the mare as well as in the environment. The foal can also consume the mare's feces and become inoculated that way or by drinking the mare's milk. Our research here shows that the foals start with very few bugs, as you said, so very low diversity. But then over time, the foal's microbiome becomes more similar to the mare's. This data is pretty consistent with the literature. So we've all seen those foals that eat poop, right? And that's great. That's a good thing. Yep. They're, they're like populating the microbiome. So um, that's really, that's kind of interesting. And, and also with the, with the nursing, I mean, they're, they're getting, you know, um, from the external teeth, right? And from the milk, right. there's a lot going on there. Mother nature set it up pretty well. So, so talk a little bit about, what I mean, do we, how many bugs do we see in the in the hindgut and the microbiome, and what's the distribution there? What does it look like of the the types of, of bacteria we see? Okay, so there are trillions of bugs <laughs> in the microbiome, so <laughs> it's really just you, you can't really even count them all. And so, um, speaking of the mares data, as I said before, this data was taken from our mares here at the farm. And this is the type of graphic that you'll commonly see with microbiome data. And what it essentially shows is the proportions of the different bacteria in the microbiome. And so these are the top four bugs. And as you can see here, the two most predominant bugs come from the Firmicutes and Bacteriodetes phylum, which that's, that's a mouthful to say. Yes, it is. And, <laughs> yes, for sure. And so this is uh, what we typically see in many species, not just horses. And both of these groups are important for digesting carbohydrates that are found in plants. And this is this is so the horse can get energy from them from plants that otherwise it couldn't digest. So and how do you say some of those other words on there, too? So you have uh, actinobacteria and proteobacteria. Okay. Those are pretty easy. <laughs> those, those are easier than the others, but the others always trip me up a little bit, but they roll That's off true. your tongue. That's impressive. <laughs> So, so we've got all these bugs in the microbiome and, and, and I think, you know, when we're feeding horses, our ultimate goal is to keep those bugs happy, right? We want to keep them in a stable, um, functioning well. And so I would like Karen to talk to us a little bit about, you know, what, are, what, do, how do we keep these bugs happy? How do we keep this 
microbiome healthy? Yeah, bugs are, you know, they're just like everybody else. They just want a comfy environment and plenty to eat. And if you give the bugs the environment that, that they thrive well in, um, and you give them plenty to eat or what they want to eat. And I think that's what, when you see that uh, makeup of the microbiome, those bugs have different jobs. They have different things they like to eat. And so what you feed definitely has an effect on that. And, you know, our, our friends in ruminant nutrition have always said this, but it's true in horse nutrition as well. There's a portion of what we feed the horse is about feeding the horse and providing nutrition to the horse. But then there's a big portion of what we feed the horse that it's actually feeding the bugs to have them feed the horse. And so, so much of our fibers, our forages are about feeding the bacteria, particularly the ones in the hindgut to keep all those happy and healthy. And so it's always interesting to me that, again, if you think about bacteria and how fast they can multiply and they, do, they don't uh, reproduce like we do, they just divide. And, and within minutes, you can have one bacteria become tens of thousands of bacteria, but if, if the environment's right. So again, if we keep the, the environment comfy for the bugs and consistent, and we keep the food supply going through there, bugs are happy. And that, that works out pretty well. So you disrupt that in any way that you can get some issues. And so, and those bugs, I mean, their food, they, they love fiber, right? They love forages. That's kind of what, that's what makes them happy. Yep. <laughs> I what yeah, they don't like big swings in temperature. They don't like big no. swings in pH or acidity. They don't like to do without food. Um, so all those things. And it's so interesting to me that so many of the things that we learned in, you know, Pony Club or 4-H or wherever you started your education on taking care of horses and feeding management and the things that we do and how we feed horses, it's about keeping the bugs happy, you know, keeping things going through there consistently, uh, not making drastic changes in your diet. All those things are about keeping that bug population happy and comfy. Yeah. And so we also know bugs can be not so happy. So what are some things that, you know, that can cause uh, some, some problems with the, the microbes? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. There's, you know, a uh, horse getting a high fever, a horse getting sick. So a high fever, um, horse going without food or water for extended periods of time. Um, horse being on uh, oral antibiotic therapy mm -hmm. for extended periods of time. Um, lots of things can disrupt uh, there and there's lots of other things too you know it's interesting and, and morgan and, and robert know way more about this but as a nutritionist historically i thought about bugs simply as in how they help the horse digest what we feed the horse in order to keep the horse healthy and provide all the nutrients but there's a whole host of other things that bugs do that are just really freaky on some level they talk to each other and they affect the whole system of the animal. And so there's this, they talk about that new frontier thing. It's just, there's mm -hmm. so much to learn. And um, I just, I'm, I'm almost jealous of Morgan because she just plays in that all the time. And it's, it's a, a big black hole of stuff we don't know. And so that's what's really cool and interesting to me. Right. Well, and, and one of the, one of those other kind of really cool things that they, there's some effect on is, is the, is the immune function, right? Because one of a significant portion of our immune system and of the horse's immune system is in the gut. And so we're learning more and more about how even immune function in horses um, can be affected by the microbiome. And that actually goes along with kind of the next thing we're going to talk about, because you can't really talk about the microbiome and bugs before, and probably some of you watching are thinking this already, how does this relate to probiotics and prebiotics and, and supplementation and things like that? And so um, we did some research at Purina several years ago um, with a prebiotic that had a specific um, benefit to immune function. So that sort of is a good segue because we, we know you know, you make the bugs happy, you have, you can do things in the gut, and then that can have a, an effect on other systems besides digestion, like immune function. So let's kind of define pro, probiotics and prebiotics for a minute. Um, it's a popular supplement, you go to any feed store, you're going to see lots of probiotic supplements out there. 
um, you're going to see a lot of prebiotic supplements or maybe not as many pre, um, you know, more likely you're going to see pro. So a probiotic, um, is, the difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic is um, whether or not they're alive. Probiotics are live microorganisms. Um, you also will hear them, you know, be referred to as direct fed microbials. Um, some of the live yeast cultures might fall into this category too, if they're intended to, to, to remain, to be alive and, and continue growing uh, later on in the track. Um, but basically, you, you know, the goal with a probiotic is to get that live bacteria back there to the hindgut, start proliferating, you know, maybe produce some vitamins, B vitamins, particularly um, these bacteria will produce volatile fatty acids. Um, that can be used as energy, um, and maybe, you know, this can support, you know, further fiber digestion, theoretically, or um, just have other health benefits like we were talking about with immune function. And so that's really what a, a probiotic would be. A prebiotic is pretty simply, it's non-living, it's non-digestible by the horse, but it's food for that microbe, okay? So that's the difference with a prebiotic. It's just the food for the horse or food for the microbes in the horse. And Karen already talked about what kept bugs, what keeps bugs happy. Fiber, you know, is probably one of the best prebiotics. So things like your forages, your beet pulps, you know, your soy hulls, things like that have lots of digestible fiber. Great prebiotic properties because those are feeding those microbes. Um, but more often when we talk about prebiotics, we're thinking about additives. So you may have yeast cell wall derivatives. You ha may have something like a fructo oligosaccharide. And these are specific additives that are, you know, the bugs really like to eat. <laughs> it makes them happy. And so it can promote um, some, you know, different bacteria to, to live and maybe have better populations uh, theoretically. So that's kind of the difference between pre and probiotics. So the question is, and especially when we talk about probiotics, is number one, they're alive. Do they remain alive through manufacturing? Okay, so when we make a pelleted feed or you have a pelleted supplement or maybe it's a powder, um, especially with pelleted products, you to make a pellet, it requires heat, moisture, and pressure, and very high heat in some cases. So depending on the manufacturing process, that can be very damaging to a live microorganism. So um, that's a really big question. There's been studies looking at probiotic um, preparations that are on the shelf that don't have anything alive left there. Um, and so that's one question that we always like to ask. Are they surviving manufacturing? And then are they surviving storage, you know, sitting on the shelf for months, sometimes years, sitting and get, get to the back of the shelf, and then you pull them out a year later. Um, you have to wonder, are these microorganisms really still alive? And I guess the, the final big question, and this is, as a nutritionist, I like to say the elephant in the room. It's like, do what do these, what do these probiotics, what do they really do in horses? Because the research in horses is extremely limited, right? Um, we, most of the, what we know about probiotics and, and the products that are on the market are based on studies either done in humans or if we're lucky, uh, other animal species. You know, there are some studies in horses, but very, very limited. And so when we have data that's generated in horse and humans and other animals, that may or may not relate to horses. Um, it gives us a good place to start, but it doesn't provide a definitive answer. So for nutritionists, it's very challenging for me to find something to recommend because the data is just not there in horses to make me very comfortable and definitively say this will or will not do something. And for you, for a horse owner, it can be really overwhelming. I mean, there, you know, it's, it's hard for me with, you know, with a PhD in nutrition to kind of sift through some of this stuff because it's so sparse, but as an owner, I think it's just, it's, it's really, really hard. So I want to ask Karen to kind of talk us through, how would you approach, I mean, because we've all been at our end of our rope, right? We've had that horse that's got persistent diarrhea. We've tried everything else. You know, maybe you are going to try a probiotic supplement. How would you go about doing that, Karen? How would we, you know, have horse owners look at that and go through that process? Well, Kelly, that's one, you know, a, 
an animal who's already got an issue, that's one thing. And obviously in those cases, we would be saying work very closely with your veterinarian and the two of you decide on a, on a program or a protocol that will help that animal. I think so many of the probiotics today are just the low level feed through, constant feed through, feed to your healthy horse, and you hope you're getting something from that. And um, so on that end, especially, um, it's, you know, the research is scant and, and the information would tell you that in, in most cases, there's very little, if any, improvement in digestion or health of the horses at this point. So, you know, in our, in our circles, we talk about the marketing outdistancing the science on this, which is very frustrating, you know, but for instance, you know, there's studies that show that if you feed certain microbes, you can pick them up in the feces, you can detect them in the feces. So they're going through there but the minute you quit feeding them, they don't colonize, they don't set up house, they, because they may not even be the species that are supposed to live there in that horse. So there's such an individual microbiome. I think that's part of the reason some of the research is so variable is that not only do horses in different barns and different feeding situations have a different microbiome, but even horses within a barn can have different um, mm -hmm. strains. It, you know, you may have, we mo you know, you and I both may have lactobacillus acidophilus. That's one that everybody thinks about. And we may both have that species of bugs or whatever, but I may have a different strain than you do. And that's why sometimes when you poll people and you ask them how many people take a probiotic themselves, and a lot of people take them, but then when you start asking, well, how many of you see a benefit? And some people will say, I do see a benefit. Some people say, I don't see a benefit, but I still take it anyway, hoping I will. And some people say, well, I tried one and I had a bad reaction and I had tried a different <laughs> one. And so the point is, is that we don't know enough about it. And that's why we have Morgan and Robert. And that's why we're working on this so hard. But for us at Purina, we have a, a Dr. Maribeth Gordon came up with a, a process that we use for this and for every other additive or ingredient or formulation situation that we come up to. And we want to make sure that as we put products and formulas together, that we take them through what we call the test ride. So we have this little logo and you'll see this on our packaging, but the test ride is our effort at making sure, kind of putting something through the test that says, is there research in horses that would tell you this will work and that this should work or there's a good chance that this will work? Um, are there ingredients that it even makes sense that those ingredients may do what are being claimed that they will do? And then is, is whatever that additive is, is it in there in enough to make a difference? Is the dose effective for the size animal and the activity level of that animal? Is that all in there in the right dose? And then is there efficacy? Can you actually see a difference in your horse? And so for at this point in time, when you run the typical probiotics that are available through that test ride, we find they don't tend to pass. On one of those levels, they're going to miss out. And typically we just don't see or, or realize the benefit from those bugs. And, you know, some of the really early work on horses it, it, and even in other species, you'll find some places where if the diet was a really poor quality diet, you may see a little bit of benefit. But when you feed a good quality diet to begin with, you see very little benefit. And I wonder if sometimes that goes back to when you feed really good quality ingredients, like really good quality oats, there's a certain amount of beta glucan in those oats. So we, I like to tell people that we've been making horse feed at Purina since 1894, and we've had prebiotics in our feed since the very beginning, because so many of the good quality natural ingredients that you use have prebiotics. So if you feed them and you feed them right and you manage that horse right, they maintain their own microbiome to the best of its ability. And so it's hard to see a benefit in a healthy horse. And then when you ask the question about the sick animal, I think you have to be really careful because at least the work in humans, there's very little work in sick horses, but the work in humans finds that maybe a probiotic that a healthy human could take and not have any problem with, if you feed that to a sick human who's got some problem, especially if they have something wrong in their digestive tract, you can actually have some problems from feeding a probiotic to a debilitated patient. So that's again why for us, it's just not, it's just not acceptable for us to do this, you know, 
a scattergun approach, like here, throw some bugs at it. You know, I, I think we just, we have to do the research and the research is going to take a little time. And that's again, what we have Robert and Morgan for. That's right. And, and I just, I, I thank you for all of that. Cause it's really, it's a good systematic way to, you know, assess, you know, different supplements, but not just probiotics, any of our supplements. Right. And so that I just love the test ride and it's, it's very clever. Um, but we're, you're kind of talking about some of the pitfalls or the, or the red flags, especially Robert, can you kind of go into a little bit more when you're accessing some of these probiotic products, what jumps out at you as something to maybe as a red flag? Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> Karen and Kelly, you both touched on so many amazing, you know, topics and, and, you know, we could sit here all day and talk about this. Right. Um, you know, but for me, probiotics as a whole for horses right now, you know, it throws up a red flag just to begin with, right? When we think about giving a horse a probiotic, like you said, it's giving a live bacterial species and expecting it to inhabit part of the horse's GI tract and do something good. Think of it this way. It's like taking a puppy and putting it in a group of another group of puppies that are already happy and, 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 and coexisting and expecting them to all be perfectly fine, right? Sometimes it'll work, but other times you're going to have some problems there, right? And the exact same thing can happen in the GI tract of the horse, right? So when we think about altering the microbiome, we need to have a base understanding of what the microbiome even is, right? So when we think about probiotics, um, you know, just the definition in and of itself, right? It's a live species. Okay, well, great. What live species? Right. So it's the identification of which one it's the, you know, processing storage, like you mentioned, Kelly, but then getting it to the right place in the horse's GI tract. Typically, like we've been talking about, we're trying to get to the hindgut. Well, it seems relatively easy to get there, but you got to get through the mouth. You got to get through the acidic environment of the stomach. You got to get through the small intestine, which is designed specifically to digest and absorb things that bacteria are made out of. And then you got to get, you know, these very few bugs. To, to get a foothold in this in this hindgut and say, I'm going to live here, I'm going to reproduce, and I'm going to do something beneficial. It's a lot of challenges, right? And that's why, you know, probiotics in general throw a red flag up. But, you know, for me, the big things are the expectation that a single probiotic species is going to have the same effect in chickens, in humans, in cattle, in pigs, all across the board. We all have very different GI tracts and, you know, it's very, you know, challenging to, to make that assumption that just because something is correct in chickens, it's going to have that same effect in the horse. And you know, a lot of the times you're going to see very common bugs, right? We've talked about lactobacillus acidophilus. We've talked about enterococcus facium. We've talked about bifidobacteria, right? But there's all different ones. And why does one work in the chicken and not work in the horse? We're still trying to understand that. So that's one of the things that I think is important to talk about. Um, the next one is is the inclusion rate, right? You know, we we, we think about the inclusion of these uh, bacterial species in, in what we call CFU, so colony forming units. And when you look at the back of a of a feed tag, you're going to see, uh, you know, if, if bugs are added, so lactobacillus, for example, you're going to see lactobacillus added at a certain number of CFUs per gram, right? And when you look at that, you're typically gonna see numbers in the millions and the billions. Million is a lot, right? A billion is a lot more, but, but let's look at this graphic here. We're really gonna see the difference in a million versus a billion, right? Anybody on here would take a million dollars or a billion dollars, right? But when you think about what is a million and how it relates to a billion, it really starts to put into perspective. If I'm providing the horse with 1 million CFUs of a certain bug versus providing a horse with 1 billion CFUs of a certain bug, that's a drastic difference. And the research that we've been working on um, at our farm with, with our young horses and our, our, our adult horses, you know, we've been feeding these horses upwards of, of 10 to 15 billion with a B CFUs of certain bugs per day repetitively. So when you look at a tag and it says, I'm going to feed my horse less than a million CFUs, it's really difficult to assume that anything beneficial is going to come of that. You know, the horse, you know, there is an expectation that as those probiotics are ingested by the horse, a lot of them are not going to be alive when they get to the hindgut of the horse, which is one of the reasons that we have to feed billions of CFUs. Right. And so, you know, that's really one of the main things to pay attention to with probiotics is, is you know, what is the bug? What is the source of that bug and how many are you actually feeding it to the horse? And if you can get through all those red flags, then you have to get to the red flag of, is it even doing anything? Which 
Yeah. We're still, we're still working on that. Well, and it's clear we have so much left to learn. <laughs> so, um, you know, can we manipulate the microbiome? How would we potentially manipulate it? Should we manipulate it? I mean, those questions are kind of still out there. So Morgan, now uh, is the time when we would like to learn from you about you know, what Purina has um, endeavored to do in, in this area and this project that we're calling the, the Microbiome uh, Quotient Project or Purina MQ Equine Project. Um, can you kind of just talk us through what this project looks like and how uh, our horse owners, how people watching today can kind of get involved and be a part of this groundbreaking research? Sure thing, Kelly. So the MQ project is a large scale nationwide analysis of the horse microbiome. As Robert said before, MQ stands for microbiome quotient. So we have IQ and EQ as measurements of intelligence and emotion. And now we're just adding in the microbiome component. And so this project launched back in October of 2019 and we're still going strong. The goal of this project is to build a large database of microbiome data and what we want to do with that data is define normal or healthy microbiome. So what the what bugs are there and are not there and in what amounts to understand the link between the microbiome and disease and to also develop effective research back pre and probiotics that pass the ride, the test ride. And so we are doing this by sending out microbiome kits to horse owners around the country. We want as much variety in our samples as we can get. So horses of any breed, any age, whether they're healthy or not. And so far, we've had a lot of success. I'm very proud to say that we have received around 3,000 samples, which is the largest collection of samples that we know of in published literature. But we aim to collect over 10,000 samples. So the more samples we have, the stronger our data will be. So I'm going to go over the microbiome kits themselves. So when you receive your kit, it will have in it very detailed instructions with beautiful illustrations, as you can see on the screen here. And the instructions also include a link to our survey. The survey will have um, all of our, basically all of our metadata. So we'll ask questions like, what, what's your horse's name? What's the breed of your horse? The age? health status, the diet, and they're very quick and easy questions to answer. So it should only take around 10 minutes to answer per horse. And so that is on the instruction sheet and that data we will use. And I'll explain later um, when I go over all the lab work that I do. We have a return mailer. And so this is a mailer with a prepaid um, label on it. And this is what you can mail your sample back in. And if you're taking more than one sample, you can mail them all into one or mail them separately. Either way works. We have a pair of gloves. Very important. Very important. <laughs> yes. Very well, important to be safe and microbiome, Not yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we have um, the sample swab. And so these are going to be anal swabs that you will take. And then very importantly, we have our sample tube. And so this has a unique sample number on it, and it also has a reagent in it that preserves the DNA and allows, uh, allows you to be able to mail it to us. And so this sample ID is what you will use in your survey when you go to fill it out. So if you do request a kit, make sure you, um, you have this number on you or write it down before you send in your sample. So I think it's, oh, yeah. we should probably point out that, you know, taking the sample itself is, is a fairly um, routine procedure and that if you've taken your horse's rectal temperature before, it's probably not un like that, but you, you do want to be very careful and, and you can always ask your veterinarian to do this. I mean, that would be even better when your veterinarian's out, like ask them if they can help you obtain the sample. That's, you know, not a bad idea either. Um, and so now once, once we've got our sample, we filled out our, uh, we filled out our information on the survey, we've mailed it to you. So tell us what you do with it when you get it, Morgan. Oh, sure. And if anybody wants to request a sample, you can do that oh, yeah. at Purina, purinamills.com slash microbiome to sign up and we'll send that to you for free. And so once we get the sample in, you can see here that I've got a sample on my bench. And we can take a look at what we do in the lab. 
So first we use an extraction kit to extract the DNA from the bacteria that are present in the sample. And so this is done by shaking the sample with microscopic beads, as you can see in that video that was playing. The beads break up those bacterial cells and release the DNA. And so now we can look at uh, the rest of that process. So we take a small amount of the sample and we run it through several filters to filter out and clean the DNA. And you can, in the next photo, you can see the progression from left to right. So here I am pipetting out that sample. And so you can see here the many filters that we use. And at the end of the day, we end up with a small DNA sample. It just keeps getting cleaner and cleaner. Yep. For sure. And so next, we can check the quality and the quantity of each sample to make sure that it can go through our analysis. So you can see here on the left, this is one of the methods that we use is to run a gel. And some of you may recognize this if you watch any of the CSIs. <laughs> and so this is just checking to see if that DNA is of good quality. And so after passing the quality check, which all these samples did, they are placed in a plate and we run them through a process called PCR. So this is where we essentially isolate the gene that we're interested in. In this case, it's the 16S rRNA gene and we make thousands of copies of it. This way we don't have to deal with the entire DNA strand. And so that, um, that occurs in the machine seen here on the right and that's a thermocycler that we purchased for this project. And then after that, we label each sample with its own unique barcode. And that's similar to the barcodes in a grocery store. And this is so we can identify it later because we're going to pull all of those samples together. And so we can see a video of that. So this is a multi-channel pipette and I'm taking up all those samples to pull them all into one tube. And now let's take a look at what three weeks of work looks like. <laughs> and so in this tube is 285 unique samples from this project, which is, is just incredible to me. And so from this tube, we take out five microliters of sample to put into our sequencer. And just to kind of give you an idea of what five microliters looks like, I'm, I have a comparison here to a quarter. <laughs> and That's that is, a, like it's a nothing. tiny amount. Yeah, it, it is. It's very small. But DNA is even smaller. So <laughs> in that, and in that tiny little amount, that is 285 samples. Yeah. We'll keep wow. that in mind. It's just, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So Morgan, so, some of, some of our, our Facebook friends have met Bob last week when we were freezing here in Texas. So if I send Bob's sample to you, when are you going to send me Bob's microbiome back? So right now we are currently building up our database. So we do not offer any of our data to our participants, but this may change in the future. So we ask that you stay tuned. And the good thing. What would I do if I knew Bob's microbiome? That's the whole point. Yeah. And that's the point. Yeah, that is the yeah. point. And that's the point. We could send you back a real pretty chart that would have lots of colors on it and lots of numbers and letters, but it wouldn't mean anything, right? And that's what we're hoping that in the future that that it does mean something, right? And so you could send us that sample and we could do the work. And then in the future, it does mean something, which is wow. why Morgan said we're not sending anything back right now. Well, but it means a lot to us to contribute yes, right. to the b body of knowledge. Exactly. Right? And, and so you're sure. like contributing to the knowledge of the microbiome for sure. <laughs> yep. As I said before, each sample strengthens our data set. So we yes. want as many as we can get. Yeah. So, well, there you go. There's our, that's our final step in the analysis process, right? Oh, so yeah. So I put that five microliters into the sequencer. And I have to say, so at the farm, we have our own aluminum sequencer. And so this was a huge investment for this project. And we can sequence DNA in-house just like a university or a commercial genomics lab, which that's, that's a great thing. And so this machine has provided us with a mountain of microbiome data, which I'll now show you a little glimpse of. And so here is a PCOA plot and each of these dots represents one sample, so one microbiome. And so you can see um, it shows you basically the differences. So if I sorted this by like breed, you can see different breeds and different colors. And so, I mean, this is around 1400 samples that we have. So it, it's a lot of data. Wow. 
Bob, so is, since, Bob is somewhere yeah. in there, Karen. Is Bob in there? Bob, <laughs> Bob we're lost contribute there. to science. <laughs> And so with all that data, we have actually um, we've actually had to design our own analysis platform to make this this process more time and cost efficient. And so we we have done that. And so you can see these beautiful outputs. And this is um, this is the data that I showed you earlier with the mares. And so this is a relative abundance chart. And so I hope um, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this behind the scenes tour. And I, I do want to take a moment to say thank you to our participants that we've had so far. And thank you to all those horse owners that are partnering, partnering with us to explore this new frontier. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We and, and thank you, Morgan, for for all of your hard work behind the scenes, because you are kind of on the cutting edge of this, too. And um, we could not do this without you. And we couldn't do this without horse owners, um, you know, For sending sure. in samples. So um, we do have the link in the chat um, where you can come and uh, sign up for a kit and we would really appreciate it. And, and I, and kind of in closing here, uh, thank you guys for sticking around with us. I just, you know, you, you can kind of see our science-based approach here at Purina and what the end results of this is, is what we hope it, our goal is it to re result in a high value feed product. So these feed products that are that are produced from not just the microbiome research, but also all of the other years of research that we've done and, and all of our existing products, you know, it results in something that works. It results in something that's um, good for the horse that does what it says it's going to do. And you know that you get what you pay for. And we really we place a high value in that. And, you know, that means that our products are, are also valuable in that respect as well. And so you know, when you go and, and, and buy a Purina horse feed product, um, not only do you benefit from all of this, this research and, and the high value products, but you also get to be a part of our research program and um, you're making an investment in our future research. I mean, you know, we are very, very fortunate um, at Purina to, to have um, the backing of, of the company and, and the philosophy of, of science-based products. And we actually did, um, and you know, we our research program gets money from 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 the sale of Purina bags of feed. So, you know, we did the calculation one time, and I, I believe Karen actually did this, and she worked it out. And where um, the the proportion of, of a bag of feed that what you're paying, it's less than five cents a bag um, from all species that goes back into the research program. So when you look at that, you know, on a per bag basis, that's not super significant. But when you, you know, spread it all out of, across all of our bags, that's a very large investment in research. And it gives us the opportunity to do really cool stuff like like what Morgan and Robert are doing at the farm on the microbiome project. And it also gives us the ability to you know, continue putting out products, continue you know, having high quality uh, assurance and things like that because we have that investment. So I just say thank you, you know, to our customers because you make this possible you know, if you believe in the science of nutrition, you know, you're playing a huge role and we, we just appreciate it. So um, with that, um, we will definitely answer any of your questions in the chat. Um, we have kind of run out of time today to do it live here, but I really appreciate everyone hanging in with us. Um, so Robert, Morgan, Karen, thanks for joining us today. You bet.